Our final speaker today is Jerome Chalia. Jerome is a former avid student who immigrated from Sri Lanka at age 11 and became the first in his family to complete high school. Jerome is now an OBGYN physician practicing in Northern California and an expert in designing public health interventions to promote health equity and efficiency. He's also the co-founder of Storytime, an organization focusing on the power of stories to connect healers. Please join me in welcoming Jerome Chahila. I think my biggest fear as a child was orphanhood. The hardest thing about living in a war zone is to become comfortable with uncertainty. And I think as humans, we crave for certainty with such vigor that it's hard to live a life where so much around you is so uncertain. What made my childhood difficult is partly because there was so much uncertainty around me at all times. There are moments where everything seems peaceful on the outside, and then there are moments where there are bomb blasts kind of continuously throughout the night. I stepped into eighth grade three days after arriving in America. I had left Sri Lanka bruised, bashed, and concussed by the terror of a raging civil war. I had lived in a state of alert, a kind of constant alarm. My brain was accustomed to the sustained surge of cortisol, because in the midst of war, anything could happen at any moment. Now, walking in the brightly lit hallway of my new middle school, that level of fear was unnecessary. But I struggled to calm the aberrant rhythm of my palpitations and silence the fear of new beginnings. A week into middle school, I sensed the unbridgeable chasm between me and others. My childhood did not mirror the childhoods of those around me. Few could understand the trauma of war or the tragedy of death. Isolated in my own narrative, I began to feel the foreignness of America, or more precisely, my foreignness to America. America in its entirety was a culture shock for me because in many ways my perception of America was an imagined country in my head. It was never really grounded in fact, it was what I thought a country could be when I came here and so then having to navigate the, the harsh realities of assimilation was a difficult process. It was the first time that I had to come to terms with the fact that I was a person of color. It was also the first time that I needed to speak English and to speak it well to be able to communicate. And so in, in some ways, I lost one of the essential skills of being a human being, which is to communicate. In the end of middle school, I would come to realize that I had been misplaced in the special education classroom. When I had arrived at the school, I had failed my placement exam with a score of two out of 100 prompting the school to assign me with the label severe learning disability. But those who assessed me had failed to understand that at the time of my assessment, I could neither read, write, or speak English. Thus, when they had asked me for my name or age, I had stared at them blankly. In high school, I was correctly placed in the ESL classroom, but by then, the fever of self-doubt had taken root. Sitting among my peers, it became clear to me that I had lost more than friends and family in the war. I had lost an education. Compared to my new peers, I was behind in every aspect. I came into AVID at my lowest point. I came in very broken. And the great thing about being broken in life is that you could be broken open to new possibilities. And what AVID did for me in my process of unraveling and my brokenness was to expose me to a world outside of high school. You know, I come from a family where no one went to high school or no one completed high school. And so AVID allowed me to envision a life, not just about what I wanted to do, but who I wanted to become as a person. 
Later in ninth grade, I would come to the realization that I am gay. Unleashing a struggle to reconcile my religious upbringing with the sin of my sexuality. Being walled in by the phantoms and paranoia of secrecy, I turned to food for comfort. Over the next couple of years, I would balloon to 250 pounds at the expense of my shrinking self-esteem. Leveled by circumstance, I became undone at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities. I joined AVID at this time of my unraveling. Over the next three years, the teachers in AVID would take my brokenness and break me open to new possibilities. In AVID, I was asked about my ambitions, my fears, and my curiosities. In AVID, I felt the animating surge of adrenaline, of possibility, of a frontier being pushed outward. AVID made possible the reimagining of my life, from one limited by circumstance to one liberated by opportunity, from one closed by boundaries to one opened by hope. AVID would become a safe playground for me to experiment, not just about what I wanted to do, but who I wanted to become. I would go on to graduate high school with a 4.3 GPA. By the time I entered college, the fever of self-doubt had broken. That is not to say that I trusted myself exclusively, but I trusted that my ability to succeed was equal to any other person. And in doing so, I came to understand that success is a feeling long before it's an actual result. I think my big mantra in life is that you can either let life happen to you or you can make life happen for you. And that decision lies solely within yourself. And so it's how you approach life that will affect whether you succeed or fail. You know, I truly do believe that you have to mentally feel like you're destined for success before the success manifests itself before you. And so going to college, even though there were many obstacles in my path still, I felt like there had to be a purpose for why I was given the opportunities that I was given compared to where I came from. And so therefore, I really needed to make sure that life happened for me and not just for me, but for the people who come after me. And so I really took on my life and my aspirations as if it has already happened. And a lot of times when you live your life that way, I, I do strongly believe that universe somehow uh, rises up to meet you at the level that you're at. I would go on to medical school where feelings of inadequacies would reemerge. But this time, I would recall what I learned in AVID about the power of hard work to push through seemingly unbeatable obstacles. I no longer ascribed anyone's success to talent because I knew that hard work was the ultimate talent. As you know, as an OBGYN, I take care of pregnant women every single day of my life. And what's amazing about pregnancy is that when conception has occurred, there is no sign of change visibly for about two to three months afterwards. Even if the mother can't see the change, she can perceive the promise of a new potential. In many ways, my avid teachers did the same for me. They could sense in me a potential that I could not yet perceive. And because they believed in me, I was able to believe in myself. And so the avid principle that I utilize every day in my life is to give people the gift of belief. Because if you can believe in someone, then they're more likely to believe in themselves. And if they're able to believe in themselves, then they can conceive something better. And if they can conceive something better, then they can surely achieve something grand. Now, as a physician, I bear witness to the unimaginable highs and unfathomable lows of people's lives, bear witness to the limitless possibilities of the human condition. And in doing so, I have learned that people are not limited by circumstance as much as they are limited by themselves. Most of us cocoon ourselves in the mediocre because we are unable to assess the ceilings of our possibilities or appreciate the infinite bandwidth of our abilities. So if we are to be truly limitless, we need to first remove the limits we put on ourselves. A couple of months ago, my husband and I went to the zoo. And when we got to the African section, we saw these majestic Maasai giraffes. At the feet of the giraffes were rats scurrying about. Both the giraffes and the rats were eating. And the giraffes being the giraffes were eating from the tops of the trees. And the rats being the rats were eating off the ground. 
What I realized in that moment was that although they both occupied the same geographic space, they were eating at the level of their vision. We as humans are very similar. We too eat and live at the level of our vision. Our lives can only materialize to the extent of the vision we have for ourselves. What Avid has done for me was to expand my vision so that I no longer ate off the ground. Avid elevated my eyes so that I could eat and live from the top. Today, I know this with certainty. If you are to ascend into the fullness of yourself, you need to elevate your eyes. When the ominous clouds of inferiority take root and threaten to rain on your ambition, elevate your eyes. When you feel the rumbling quakes of change pushing you to take shelter in stagnation, elevate your eyes. When the comfort of mediocrity distances you from the discomfort of pursuing your calling, elevate your eyes. When the bank of opportunity seems bankrupt and you are unable to cash your promissory note for a better life, elevate your eyes. When your dreams feel displaced, dislodged, and dislocated, elevate your eyes. When you feel beaten, battered, broken, and bruised, elevate your eyes. Today, I am changed, changed in immeasurable ways in relation to the 11-year-old boy who landed in this country. Some may say that my evolution is accidental, a stroke of chance, but I know that is not the truth. My life is a testament to those teachers who tirelessly believe that I was worthy of an education. Education is the elixir for the soul. Thank you so much.